It's so good to be here. Uh, Hillary and I love to be with you. Um, we thank you for your prayers for our church this morning. And um, I just tell you, it's, it's such a blessing as we uh, go back with uh, Jason and Kelly and JC and Josh to before JC and Josh were, uh, over about 20 years ago now. And uh, it's just so good to see uh, what God is doing among you for his glory and for your joy. And I love the, the bridge of this song that, that we trust in the power of your word. So would you go with me uh, to God's word? Today's reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 11 to 25, and it's on page 909 in the Pew Bible. I remember when we were in Port Lavaca, Jason did a, a whole series and... Actually, we had a whole part of our ministry that was formed around this passage. So it's, it's near and, and we love it. Um, so go with me, Luke 2, 11 to 25, with God's word. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other and as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with him, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose at the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, brother. You may have heard me or remember me saying that there was a time in my early days of ministry when I would be all about vision and and in talking about all that I feel like God was wanting us to do. And there was this man one day that showed up at my office and said, it was on Monday morning, right after I preached on Sunday, and he's there, and he basically said, so, okay, so what's the plan? And I'd already forgotten what I preached. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, you just said this, cast this vision yesterday, and what's the plan? Let's go. And 
that was John, and John's always been that way in my life, um, lovingly telling me things that I need to hear, lovingly supporting me. He and his wife have been very dear, um, and he's right. This is a chapter that uh, way before I met John had impacted my life. Many people have their stories in the Bible that they cling to, and they say, that's my story, and I got to say, this is one of those for me. And it impacted me when I was looking and working through different ministry objectives and different ministry places to go. I had to go back to seminary. I was basically in a time of, of a valley in my life. I was really down. And when I came to this chapter and read how simple and how specific and what it did for these men, it changed everything for me and my goals as a minister and a preacher of the gospel. We are in this series together, and we are talking through our mission statement together and what it means to be grace together in 2020. And to be grace together and to do it together, we have to understand our mission, and we need to be on board together. We need to be moving in the same direction. And and so our mission statement is this, to cultivate a community where people encounter God, are equipped with the truth, and learn how to engage the world. I'll repeat it. To cultivate a community where people encounter God, are equipped with the truth, and learn to engage the world. So we're looking at three stories each week, and we're talking about each one. Last week we looked at the encountering God aspect of our mission statement. We looked at the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. We were reminded last week that it was an ordinary woman doing ordinary tasks, thirsting in ordinary ways. And then she encounters an extraordinary Savior. You're like, why didn't you just say that last week? Well, I didn't think about using the ordinary, ordinary, and then extraordinary until this week, but... She encountered the one who promises her living water that would satisfy her, that would quench the deepest thirst that she's ever had, the one that would fulfill her greatest needs, the one who exposed her wounds, who revealed her pain, who took her to a scary place in her history and reminded her of what she has craved in her past, and the one who would say to her, that all that could be behind you because the one who is with you is the one you've been looking for. We remember that an encounter with the living God changes everything. A true encounter with the living God changes us. And here at Grace, we pray every day. I pray every day. I hope you join me in praying every day that every Sunday, every time we're on campus, that we have this expectation as a community that we would encounter the living God, that we don't go to bed on Saturday night going, well, I guess we'll go to church before the Cowboys play. It's going to be a while till they play again. I mean, I guess we'll go to church before we start our day in the afternoon. No, I'm praying that we cultivate a community together in 2020 that when you go to bed on Saturday night, you're going to bed like, I'm going to encounter God tomorrow. That we'd come with a longing and expectation to see him. That we'd really believe the song that we just sang. Oh, Spirit, would you come and fill us now? Well, last week we talked about that. Today we see a different story. We learn the importance of cultivating a community that equips with truth. And so I invite you to answer this one question or to consider this one question this morning as we get through this. Ask this. Is my heart on fire for God? That sounds a little campy, doesn't it? It sounds like something an evangelist would come to town, pitch a tent up and invite you and and try to get you on fire. No, I'm asking you sincerely to, to answer the question honestly with yourself. Would you say that your life, your heart is on fire for God? Do you love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the beauty, not only of this story, but everything that this story is saying for us. Help us to have a hunger for you, a thirst for you. Help us, O Lord, to burn 
deeply for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Similar to last week, we don't really know much about these men. We do know that one of them is named Cleophas. We do know that they go back, and it seems like their, their engagement with the eleven when they return to go back, we'll get to that in a minute, um, seems like they knew them. So they were um, aware, in a way, the, of who the followers of, of Jesus had been. They obviously, knowing all their story and what they're saying, they knew things in their mind. They knew the events, and they knew what Jesus had done and who he was. They were sort of close to the scene, you would expect. But other than that, we don't know much about them. We do know when they start to talk and we start to hear the story, we do learn much about them. We learn that they are confused people. Verse 17, we see, um, it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. And so Jesus says to him, what is the conversation that you're holding with each other as we talk? And they stood still looking sad. And then as they explain what was going on, we'll get to some of that in a minute. You can just hear the confusion in their mind. They are religiously confused. They don't know how to make sense of what's going on. So because they're confused, they are st- They stand still. They're looking for God. They're trying to make sense of it, but they're sad in their pursuit. They're seeking sad people. They're confused. That means they were without a mission. They're standing there sad. They're walking aimlessly to another town. They have no purpose, which means, as they even said there, they're sort of at this place in their life where they are hopeless. In verse 21, it's telling the story of what has happened, the current events. It says, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. You don't have to read between the lines to know that these men are sad, aimless, hopeless. It was like the religious figures of their time. They even blamed us that the religious people had come and they sent him away to be crucified. Like everything that we had hoped for in our religion has robbed us, taken from us. We're hopeless. They are obviously lacking understanding. So in a way, these men are like most of the unchurched people in our culture. They're disappointed religious seekers. We notice them all around us. These are people that have tasted certain religions. They think they got it all figured out up here. They thought they had it all figured out. But deep down, if they were to be honest, they're hurting. They're seeking. They're confused. Maybe there are people around us that have been taken up by spiritual hype. They signed, maybe when they were little, a card that says, I'm committing the rest of my life to Christ. And, and maybe they didn't have a church that they grew up in that partnered with them to train them what that means. They're lacking. They're confused. And there are people all around us like this. I mean, how many people maybe are even in this room or people that you know that would say that maybe they're Christian, but they honestly are lacking hope, joy, what Jesus would call abundant life. There's no zeal in them. They go to church because they feel like, well, it's Sunday, we're supposed to do this. How many lack truly abundant life that Jesus has promised? How many of them are moping without hope? They're disguising their emptiness maybe with busyness and and task and 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 the church in our culture is full of busy religious sad people so together grace 2020 i pray that we will have no one that would fit that description Last week we saw the woman at the well. It was the same thing. Busy, 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 doing her chores, going through life, seeking, seeking, seeking. Then she encounters Jesus Christ. She finds everything that she needs. And so here we have these two guys that are at this place. They have an encounter too with Jesus. You're like, well, why don't we talk about their encounter? Well, we are. 
But Jesus, as he encounters them, he also provides another part of the remedy. It's not just that they encounter Jesus. There's another part of the remedy here. And the remedy is this, that he is going to equip them with the truth. What do we mean by equip? That's a weird word. You don't use that in your family today. Okay, kids, come on. It's time for equipping, right? They might hear whipping and then never come, right? Equip is to supply with necessary items for a particular purpose. It's to supply with necessary items for a particular purpose. These men are examples of the everyman who wants to believe, who wants to fulfill their purpose in life and their mission in life, but they lack the supply of what they need to do that with zeal and joy. So they're like most of us, lacking what we need for the purpose that God has made us to be. They're sad. They're hopeless. So what does Jesus do to supply that need that they have to live the life that he's created them to live? Jesus equips these men with truth. And how does he do it? He does it lovingly so let's look at three ways he loved them and how he equipped them the first one is this he loved them by equipping them he engaged is this he engaged them and walked with them how did he lovingly equip them he engaged them and he walked with them look with me in verse 15 while they were talking and discussing with each other (coughs) Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus met them where they were. He engaged them on their road. It takes effort to go out of your way to connect with people on their road. People who aren't hoping, people who are disillusioned by religion may not be coming on your road into this place on this campus. So just like he did with the Samaritan woman, he steps out of his way. He goes and connects with them on their road. And I know I'm kind of giving you a sneak peek to next week on engaging, but that's what he does to begin the equipping. It it required him to go out of his way and meet them where they were. He engaged them. Notice, not only does he engage them on their road, he walks with them. I love this. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He didn't just hold up a sign and said, you're wrong, turn. He didn't even hold up a sign that says, don't go that way, go this way. And notice with these guys here in this story, he didn't even say, you're wrong on this road, turn around and go my way this way. Now we do know Jesus is the way. But here in this story, he joins them on their road and he walks with them on their road. I love that he doesn't say, hey, I'm going to talk with you. And I got stuff to share with you, but you got to come to my Wednesday morning Bible study. He doesn't say, you need to come to my Tuesday night community group. He doesn't say, hey, here's a little card. I want you to come to my church. Even though all of that, I would say, yes, that's good. Invite people. Please do that. But that's not what Jesus does here. He draws near to them and he walks with them them he engages them where they are and he continues with them sometimes the most loving thing you can do for somebody is not demand that the only way you're going to talk to them is that they come to you maybe the only place they'll meet with you is at chupacabra and you got to sit there and wonder oh no what do i tell my pastor if he's i don't care what you have to tell me meet with them talk with them guests don't know what chupacabra is you'll google it and the second thing that we see here that he does lovingly is he listened to them look with me in verse 16 (laughs) their eyes were kept from recognizing him and he said to them what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk and they stood still looking sad and one of them named cleopas 
answered him and says, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? He's asking the king of kings. Have you visited Jerusalem? Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? What's happening, guys? Tell me what's on your heart. Tell me what you're scared of. What has shaken y'all? He knows. But part of the equipping that Jesus sees is it's good for confused people to have the freedom to explain their situation. In the process, they truly revealed a lot of their own struggle. Here's what we see here, that Jesus is not just drawing near. He's not just walking with you. He's listening. He's not going to be like, whoa, did not expect to hear that. Good luck. I'm going to go back over here with these people. No, he's walking with them. He's listening to them. And this is part of the loving work of equipping. Not demanding that everybody has the perfect answer and the perfect speech and the perfect way to talk it's like okay this is where you are i'm gonna walk with you i'm gonna listen to you it's very loving what jesus does here the third thing he does as he lovingly equips them he lovingly tells them the truth he told them the truth look in verse 25 he said to them oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, and he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He calls them foolish. The original word there really means unwise. It means not knowing. We hear that word foolish and like there is nothing loving in what Jesus just said. Have you ever been called a fool? Doesn't feel good. But it is loving what he's doing here. It's loving in two ways. He's he's telling the truth and the way he's doing it is loving in two ways. First of all, it's loving because they needed correcting. It's not the first time, it's not the only time I should say, that Jesus called somebody a fool for being unwise and not applying the scriptures. We are going to look at this in several weeks when we get into the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus said, if you're hearing scripture and you're not applying scripture, you're like a foolish man that's building his house on the sand. It was loving that he corrected them. It was loving that he says, you think you're going the right way. You're not going the right way. Don't worry. I'm here with you. I'm going to help you. But you're foolish. Maybe we wouldn't use those words in our day. Maybe we would say, you know what? You're acting in ignorance. Like, no, that that wouldn't work in my small group either. Maybe you say, you know what? We're just unwise here. Let's dig deeper. Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that was written. It's very loving that he corrects them. It's loving that he tells them the truth also that they needed the truth. (laughs) I mean, would it be loving for Jesus to go, yeah, I'm walking with you. It's cool hanging out with you. Yeah, I'm on your, I've never been on this road before. I'm on your road. I'm listening to you. Good luck. When he knows they're sad, he knows they're hopeless, and he knows, just like with the woman at the well, that what they are seeking is in their presence. It was loving that he revealed the truth. This is loving. Misunderstanding and misguided precepts are building our lives on humanism. Man-made philosophies leads to a life of error because it's driven from error. We are prone. Did you know this? I just want to free you up. We are prone to biblical error. We are. What do you know? I'm not, I'm not prone to biblical error. I went to vacation Bible school when I was eight. I'm not prone to that. 
Yes, we are prone to biblical error because we are prone to take shortcuts. This means we, we won't rely on God's word. We won't learn God's word. Why do we want shortcuts? No, it's too long. I gotta re- Jason, your reading plan, that's a, I got to read that much every day? So we settle for shortcuts, which lead us to biblical error. We are prone to biblical error because we are prone to let feelings and our own comfort trump God's special and specific revelation for our lives. I don't like that he just called somebody a fool. I'm going to change that. I don't like that, so I'm going to ignore that. I don't know what that means, so I'm going to move in a different direction. We're prone to biblical error because we're uncomfortable This means we don't rely on God's word as truth and as sole authority because naturally we don't like authority. And we don't like that his word is authoritative. So we'll take the shortcuts and we'll take our feelings over what it says. We're prone to biblical error because we think we need more than God's special, direct, divine revelation. We need extra stuff. Well, I mean, come on. There's, we don't need, I mean, we need more than what's in the, this book, right? It's kind of a shortcut that we're doing there, but we're also saying that we don't really trust that his word is sufficient. So we run to our devotionals that maybe say half a verse and then three pages and paragraphs of Here's how you should interpret this. Now, don't mishear me. I have devotionals in my life. I have books that I read that are devotionals, but here's how it works in my life. Here's what I'm encouraging you, and here's what Jesus would say. Now, don't let devotionals map out your theology. I spent about 15 minutes in a devotional, and I spent about an hour in God's Word. Not the other way around. If ever it becomes the other way around, I stop doing the devotionals. And I say, okay, there's something wrong with the way I'm seeing the Bible that I would rather run to this than to his word. We must trust the word of God or we're going to be prone to biblical error. We're prone to biblical error also because we don't really know what he's told us. We're ignorant of it. And so we're not clinging to the promises of God. Instead, we cling to the promises of a celebrity that will tell you things that you should know about God. So what's the big deal about biblical error? Okay, if everybody is prone to biblical error, Jason, is it really that big of a deal? Well, yes. Errors, biblical errors, keep us in the dark. Not knowing when God speaks or what he's promising for our hope and joy leaves us sad. And so we hop from church to church until we find somebody that can kind of say the right thing at the right time that can maybe make us feel really good in the moment. Error keeps us in the dark. It keeps us thirsty. It keeps us looking for something else. Error promotes the created over the creator. If our life is living and submitting to biblical errors, we will celebrate the human over the divine. There's nothing wrong with appreciating and loving what God has created, but when it takes the center stage of our hearts, it has become an idol. And we go back to last week. It does not satisfy. When we allow a man or a woman's creativity their talents, their idea to become everything to us, it will cheapen the divine promises of a sovereign God. The reason is those talents, that creativity, they run out. The smoke and the lights and the the sound will change. But God's word never changes. Error keeps our hearts bound, keeps them trapped, keeps us, like these guys, stuck 
aimless, trapped, looking for the next celebrity pastor, looking for the next devotional book, looking for the next movement or the next revival that's scheduled or some cool band, the next, the next, the next. Never satisfied. Never on fire. Never, whether we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Eventually fizzing into a free sadness. But it's not really free. It's a bound to our experience versus bound to the truth. So being equipped with truth is the most loving thing we can do for one another at grace. Being equipped with truth saying that sola scriptura will be what is the authority of our scripture of our church i love here that jesus points the people using scriptures to himself i do not want to point you to me i do not want any teacher of the bible to point themselves to them i don't want to point you to the coolest greatest community group because that home is the better home in this no i want these places myself included to be an instrument to point you to the one who satisfies so how do we apply this vision here at grace we don't want to be in biblical error. We want together in 2020 to be grace together. How do we equip together? Well, let's look at our mission statement again. Our mission statement says to cultivate a community that encounters God and equips with truth and engages other. So how do we cultivate this community, this culture? It's what we're after, right? Well... There are several ways, I'll just run these through real quick, that I pay attention to, and I want us to all help each other this year to pay attention to, to keep and create and cultivate a culture of equipping at our church. First of all, we, we want to cultivate and we want to make sure as we apply this mission and apply this to our lives that we are creating and cultivating a culture that expects to encounter God. I've already said this, I've already referred to this, but I'm going to keep saying it. You should keep talking about it in your homes, in your families. Are you expecting to encounter God? Secondly, we should create a culture that allows our people to come as they are. Ruth and I talk about it. She'll talk to people and she'll say, you know, how am I supposed to dress when I come there? As you are. Well, am I supposed to wear a tie? And I don't see him today. Am I supposed to wear suspenders with shorts? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just come as you are. We have to create a culture, cultivate, I'm sorry, a culture that allows people to come as they are. Thirdly, we have to cultivate a culture where we will walk with one another and listen to them. This is so important. We must cultivate a culture where people can come in and know that when they, if they're going to be like the Samaritan woman and they, it's like, okay, today's the day. I'm going to share that I've had five husbands and the one I'm currently living with is not my husband. Today's the day. I'm going to be vulnerable. Today's the day. I'm going to like let this out. We need to make sure that we have a culture here that will listen to them. Yeah, it may shock us what we hear, but listen to them. For people to share their pain, to show their scars, they're already at a place of vulnerability. They just need somebody that will say, I'm with you. I'll walk with you. You're going to hear more about this. Uh, well, let me just say, first of all, we do this um, with our community groups. We want to make sure that our community groups have a culture where where we listen and we'll walk with one another. We want to cultivate more and more discipleship relationships where one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three is happening, where people can be real and honest with each other. But what you're going to hear more and more about this year is a ministry called the Stevens Ministry. 
Mary has been training people. They meet every Friday. You'll drive in here on Friday. There'll be cars kind of in there. Those are people that are, that are spending time, taking the time to, to hear how they can be people that walk along the side of the road with people who are hurting. It's very important. Mary's doing a wonderful. She's passionate about this. She's let go of everything else. She says, I want to do this. To which I say, what do you need? Let's, let's do it. We want to cultivate a culture where we walk with one another, listen to each other. Fourthly, we want to cultivate a culture where we open the scriptures. Jesus walked with them, listened to them, and then he opened the scriptures. We must see that the promises of God are there to help us and to hold us. We must see that the truths of God are there to give to us so that we can help people with it. Don't be afraid to say, well, let's see what God says about that. And do your best to lead them there. If you don't know where to go, you call somebody that you think might know. If they don't know, then y'all agree together. Let's find somebody to point us where we're supposed to go. Let's us get equipped so we can equip with the truth. Cultivate a culture that expects to encounter God, that allows people to come as they are, to walk with one another, and listen to one another, that will open up the scriptures. We do this in community groups, of course. But we have Bible study groups that meet throughout the week. We have one that meets on Monday morning, women's. We have one that meets on Wednesday morning, it's men's. We have one that meets on Sunday mornings, and it's co-ed. Ooh. In fact, do me a favor. Everybody say with me, Sunday morning Bible study. Ready? Sunday morning Bible study. Okay, it's not Sunday school. Because Sunday school is different than everything else, right? No, that's a Bible study. We have one on Monday. We have one on Wednesday. We may have more spring. Oh, we have, we have another one on Thursday. We have others that meet. We have, we have Bible studies that are going to be happening. Let's just call them all Bible studies. That's what it is. It's studying the Word of God together. Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Beautiful, good, rich. And, of course, we think all of this is the key. We have to create a culture, cultivate a culture where our hearts would be open. We must have leaders and everybody openly acknowledge what their needs are and openly acknowledge what their idols tend to be. These guys on the road to Emmaus, they were kind of confessing, this is what we've been hoping in. And Jesus says, well, that's foolish, isn't it? Let me show you the Word of God. And we must cultivate a culture that allows important application and honest responses. All done in relationship, in community, not in isolation. When we resist walking with others that want to walk with us, We're pushing them away. We're missing the opportunity, and we're going to remain sad, and we're going to be stuck with everything we know. And Jesus is saying, don't be stuck with everything you know. Let me open this up for you. Relying on Sunday morning preaching and music, yes, might feel safe. Come in. You made it to Sunday you hear the preaching, you get caught up in the music, it might feel safe, you get to keep everybody at a distance, but what if, what if Dana and Sam really tank it? What if the sound goes out? What if they're sick, we don't have any singing that day? Let me, let me go even worse. What, what if the person that you're relying on every week for your spiritual food me in the Bible, let's say you're only coming to hear me preach. What if, Lord forbid, and I pray against this, and I have people praying against this, but what if I get into moral failure and everything you've been relying on is me? Your walk, you'll be walking the rest of your day, not with joy or with thriving. You'll be walking like these guys, sad with a limp. Everything you hoped in is broken and By the way, most everybody out there can tell a story of some leader that has disappointed them. 
But what they need is somebody to walk with them on the road and say, yeah, it's not about Jason. I mean, he, I like him. I, I love him. We're praying for a pastor, but it's not about him. Let me, let me point you to Jesus. Jesus equipped them. He did it by engaging them, walking with them, listening to them, telling them the truth, one on two. Not preaching, not pitching a tent, not saying, come to my miracle service. He just lifted their eyes to the beautiful promises of Scripture. Are you in this type of community? Are you with people that are going to help you understand the Bible? I pray that you are. Is there anyone in your life that you're walking with, ministering to? Have you ever come to night of prayer? Yes, our main thing that we want to do is really pray and go before the Lord and intercede. But you know what also is happening at night of prayer? Equipping. We want to instruct and teach and model how to pray to God. So what are the results of Jesus equipping them? Look with me in verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. I don't know why he vanished. I have an idea, but don't have time for that today. But look with me in verse 32. They said to each other, and I pictured this scene, I don't know, maybe a hundred something times in my life. Were they sitting down at this point? Were they standing up? Were there tears in their eyes? Were there goosebumps all over them? Here's what they said. Did our hearts, hearts burn within us while wow. he talked to us did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road on the road that we're on on this really ridiculous road in our skepticism in our doubt in our faithlessness in our sadness in our hopelessness he came and taught the word and it made our hearts burn Love this. While he talked with us and on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. There's more. It says they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven there with them gathered, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he, was, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. There was no more sulking. There was peace. There was no more moping. There was praise. There was no more aimless living. It was missional. There were no more blind to anything. Their eyes were seen and they were given hope and zeal. They were no longer bound or stuck. They were on fire. They warned Jesus not to go on. No, it's getting late. Stay with us. Yeah, they wanted to hear more from Jesus. Yeah, they wanted him there, of course, right? But also it says it was getting late. It was getting late, so let's just stay here. Well, when he left, their hearts burned. They didn't care how late it was. That very hour, they took and went back to Jerusalem where the chaos was where the evil was, at night. There's no strategic plan. Jesus didn't even tell them to do that. Their hearts were on fire, and here's what I believe. I believe that when our hearts are on fire and the relationship with Jesus is fueled by God's Word, we are launched, and we don't need a pastor to tell us who to go talk to. We just go. We just try to inform, we try to equip, we walk with people, we tell them these men are armed with the truth and the encounter of God's word. Let me ask you this morning, what I asked you at the beginning, is your heart on fire for God? Is it? What's lacking? What 
discipline of equipping in the truth is missing in your life. I want to encourage you to join us as a church together to allow, the co- allow God to stoke the coals of the fire that's in you so that perhaps you will no longer be limping in your faith, that you too will be on fire with the gospel. I want you to close your eyes, and, and if you want to bow your heads, great, but I just want you to just sort of push out any other distraction right now, and I want you to think with me what it is you need to get more in the Word of God. Perhaps you're like me, and you've been equipped, but occasionally you slip into isolation. This week, one thing that you can do is you can reach out to thank someone who has equipped you in your life. And then you can ask them, would you pray that I would get back into the scriptures? You hear that? Reach out to them and thank them, and then ask them to pray for you to get back into scriptures. Perhaps you're here today and you need to talk to somebody about what it means to be saved, to begin your journey, to get Jesus near you and in you and teaching you. And maybe you're here and you need someone to walk with you. I want you to have the courage right now, if that's you, in any of those, I want you just to pray and ask God, to have somebody come alongside you, disciple you and equip you. Will you do that right now? And I believe in this room, there are many answers to that prayer. I want to ask you to have the courage to pray this morning, God, would you show me who I am to go walk beside and listen to and help know the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we we love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. We thank you that that He is Emmanuel, God with us, and that we can encounter You through Him. I pray that we would no longer be foolish and sad and confused, but that we would learn Your promises. And I pray that we would no longer settle for our community being foolish and sad and confused, but we would go to them and walk with them. For the fame of Jesus, we pray these things.